our descent, our caste status. Here, courts are often being asked, where, does, where do you draw the line? Which forms of discrimination do we call race discrimination? And which forms fall into other categorizations? This was a difficult issue for the UK courts in a very famous decision in the UK, Mandlin and Dawel Lee, the Mandlin Dawel. The House of Lords had to decide, in a, and it's a case that's already been mentioned, Sikh boy being excluded from the school on the grounds that the school rules did not permit him to wear a turban. At the time, there was no legislative protection against religious discrimination. So the court, the House of Lords, had to decide, was that type of discrimination, did it fall within the category of race discrimination? And the House of Lords said yes, that Sikhs can be considered a group with a shared common history and a common cultural basis. that marked them and that indicated that they could be defined for the purposes of UK legislation as an ethnic group, in addition to being a religious group. That meant they came within the scope of, of protection against race discrimination. That meant that at the end of the process, the boy in question won his case because the court held that the that the school's refusal to accommodate his desire to wear a turban constitutes indirect race discrimination. But for a long time, UK law had faced difficulties with anti-Muslim discrimination. Because Muslims were not an ethnic group. So they fell outside of the protection against race discrimination unless a case of indirect race discrimination could be made out. That's all changed. UK legislation now protects against religious discrimination. But I use that as an example of the questions of boundaries, which can present courts with real challenges. Caste is an interesting issue as well for countries like the UK and almost all European countries, in fact, I think all European countries, who do not have a prohibition on caste discrimination. It's a new problem in many ways, linked to migration patterns. It appears, unlike, it appears that caste discrimination is not at present prohibited in, under, in, in UK law. Lord Phillips, in the um, Jewish Free School case that Lord Walker referred to this morning, said clearly that dissent is not covered by UK race discrimination law. As a consequence, as Lord Lester has indicated, the new UK Equality Act, if you look in, what, in, in the hundreds of pages in there, you will find buried somewhere a provision allowing the government to extend the legislation to cover caste discrimination. And as we speak, there is a debate in the UK about that specific issue. But these are what I call boundaries. How far do you stretch the protection against race discrimination? And it's often a very important issue. Because race discrimination is often regarded as an extra bad form of discrimination, where justifications are not ordinarily allowed. In UK race discrimination legislation, for example, there are almost no justi that there are no justifications permitted for direct race discrimination. There are very, very few exceptions, almost vanishingly few exceptions to the prohibition on direct race discrimination. That more exceptions exist when it comes to age, gender even, sexual orientation, religious discrimination, and so on. So the question of boundaries becomes important. Who is covered by extra strong race discrimination legislation? Who might come outside and be covered by, by different types of legislation that might not be as strong? And that's an important issue for courts to deal with. Another set of important issues is what counts as discrimination? Now you are all aware about direct discrimination 
and indirect discrimination, the two major forms of discrimination under most forms of race discrimination legislation. Ra direct discrimination, as you know, focuses on the question of, well, was someone discriminated against directly on the grounds of their race or ethnic origin? Baroness Hale in the UK has characterised it as, um, as, as being very closely involved with combating stereotyping. And the advantage of the strict prohibition on direct race discrimination is that it, it very much combats the application of lazy and general stereotypes to particular groups. A very interesting UK decision I'll mention very briefly is the Prague Airport decision. Um, Roma gypsies, as they used to be known, are, as you will be aware, an extremely disadvantaged group in Eastern Europe. They've been subject to long sustained patterns of systematic disadvantage for hundreds of years. As the Czech Republic and other Eastern European countries were coming into the EU, Roma began to come to the UK and claim asylum. The UK government said there are too many Roma coming in, the Czech Republic will be in the EU in a couple of years, we want to block Roma coming in as far as possible. So they set up a, 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 effectively an immigration screening mechanism in Prague Airport whereby Czech travellers travelling from Prague to London and other UK airports were subject to preliminary screening by UK immigration officers. The evidence very clearly showed, and Lord Vestor was involved in this case, so he knows all the details of this case infinitely more than I do, but the evidence very clearly showed that Roma travellers were being singled out for special treatment. And what you may not know, by the way, is that Roma tend to have darker skin colours than others in Eastern Europe. But they were being singled out for, for extra intensive immigration controls. And the question was, was this prohibited? Because counsel for the government, to make a complicated argument simple, argued, well, there is a problem with many Roma applying, many Roma making questionable asylum applications, so therefore, the government isn't stereotyping on the grounds of their race. The government is basically just taking into account a social call of, of individuals from a particular background and is simply responding to that social call. But this isn't race discrimination. I'm simplifying, but you get the idea. And the House of Lords unanimously held, no, 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 applying the English legislative framework this is direct race discrimination. It's, 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 it's effectively treating people less favorably on the grounds of their ethnic origin, on the grounds of their ethnicity. And the government may have its own reasons for choosing to treat people, these people in a very specific and special way. Whether those are good reasons or bad reasons, it's not our concern. Our concern is to simply apply the legislation and to very clearly decide this is direct race discrimination, which is not capable of being justified, therefore, end of story. Indirect discrimination is also extremely important. As Lord Walker has indicated, when it comes to gender discrimination, it's been a major vehicle for social change. Indirect race discrimination sometimes runs into difficulties, for various complex reasons I won't go into, but it's an important aspect of the law. There are other forms of discrimination which are also covered by the EU and UK legislative frameworks. Discrimination on the grounds of harassment. Harassment counts as a special form of discrimination. You have victimization as a special form of discrimination. If you are penalized for bringing a claim, like the example given earlier, then that counts as a special form of discrimination. Okay. Furthermore, Something can count as direct discrimination if it involves perception or association. That if someone perceives you of being of a particular race or ethnic group 
and treats you in that manner, even if they're wrong, that still counts as direct race discrimination. The same is also true of association. If you are treated less favorably because you associate with people of a particular ethnic ethnicity, then that will also count as race discrimination. So for example, and again, Lord Lester brought many of these cases, involved in many of these cases, perhaps tell you more about this than I would. Case from the UK in the 1960s about someone being thrown out of a bar because they were white, but because they had been seen being friendly with black migrants to the city. Court said, right, you were discriminated against on racial grounds. You were discriminated against on the grounds of your association with people of a particular ethnicity. And that's, that can be quite important. So we have different types of discrimination exist under the UK and EU legislative frameworks. Let me talk very briefly now and start wrapping up my, my remarks very quickly by pointing out some problems, which again, courts have had to engage with. <coughs> Burden of proof, proving discrimination can be a very, very difficult issue, which has caused great difficulties for the UK courts and for courts across Europe for a very sustained period of time. There now exists both national and EU legislation that governs burden of proof rules and introduces special burden of proof rules in discrimination cases. And I explain this, I tried to explain this recently in Strasbourg and um, it caused heavy confusion because different countries have very different views of the burden of proof. But putting it very, very simply, the UK legislative framework now says if you want to, if you can show sufficient, if you can show evidence that raises a serious suspicion, a serious, a reasonable inference that discrimination has taken place, then the burden of proof shifts, and it's the defendant, the person defending the action, who has to show that no discrimination took place. But it's not just for race discrimination; it's across all the other discrimination fields. But it can be particularly important in race discrimination, especially when you combine it with the use of statistical evidence. You might find it difficult to, it might be difficult to produce evidence that shows someone clearly discrimination. You know, someone saying, no, I will not hire Asian people. No, I will not hire Irish people. No, I will not hire Swedish people or whatever. People increasingly are less stupid. They won't say it, but they may be as stupid as ever, but they are becoming cleverer in their stupidity. If they want to discriminate, they will often not say it as openly as maybe they once have done. But the results can be the same. But if you can show statistical evidence, if you can show that no one from a particular ethnic group has succeeded in, 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 in being hired for a particular position, or that mysteriously when an employer dismisses workers, he only dismisses ancient workers, then that can satisfy the burden of proof and then, sh and then the onus shifts to the defendant to try and show that they haven't in fact discriminated. That can be very important. And that's been shaped by a mixture of judicial willingness to look again at burden of proof rules and also legislation dealing with these issues. Multiple discrimination is a big problem. People discrimination against because of the race, gender, religion, combination of factors. The UK is struggling with this all over Europe. There is a struggle with this. Um, courts have found it difficult, I think, and I think there are can be quite difficult issues of proof in this context. Fashioning and designing appropriate remedies, as all of you will know, is very can be very very difficult in the race discrimination context. And assessing damage awards how much money should go to hurt to feelings, issuing injunctive relief, if that's the remedy available. Fashioning remedies, a complicated business. The two final areas of, if you want, difficulty when it comes to race discrimination, which are, I think, 
quite specific to race discrimination in certain ways. First of all, the question of, of, of positive action. Now, in European systems that keep the focus on negative approaches, banning discrimination, positive action sometimes causes difficulties because it can be seen as an exception. Whereas in systems like yours in South Africa, where if you want positive action can be, or, or positive discrimination, whatever forms of action, whatever term you want to use, is reasonably well established as something different. That can result in avoiding some of the difficulties the jurisdictions that the UK and the US have sometimes had to deal with in this context. What is, I think, becoming apparent, and this goes back to my point about the differences between individual rights systems and communal rights systems being exaggerated. What is becoming interesting is that courts in Europe, and especially the European Court of Justice over the last 10 years, have begun to relax their approach to positive action. They now allow positive action in certain circumstances where you've equally qualified candidates and you can choose, say, to prefer a woman if women are currently disadvantaged. The, the new UK legislation, the Equality Act, r relaxes UK law in a similar way. The extent to which positive action should be used in the context of race always causes great difficulty in Europe, perhaps more difficulty than it should. Um, there's often a reluctance, there's often a willingness to use positive action in the context of gender, which isn't matched by a willingness to use it in the context of race discrimination. There's complicated reasons for that. A final area, very briefly, is the issue of positive duties of the state when it comes to combating race discrimination. And here we have had some very interesting judicial decisions in the last few years. From the European Court of Human Rights, we have the Nachova versus Bulgaria decision, where the European Court of Human Rights held that Bulgaria was in violation of the Convention for failing to investigate strong allegations that someone had been killed in a police station and that they had been killed effectively because the police were racist and hated Roma. The person killed was from the Roma minority, the disadvantaged minority. They were killed in mysterious circumstances. There was an investigation. The investigation wasn't completely convincing. Um, in, but in particular, the allegation that racism was at the heart of the killing wasn't investigated. The European Court of Human Rights said in the circumstances of the case that constitutes a violation. That is, I think, an extremely important recent decision of the European Court of Human Rights. Um, Connors versus the UK, a case that has caused all sorts of difficulties in the UK. The issue about um, European Court of Human Rights indicated that um, travellers, who are a distinct ethnic group in the UK and Ireland, may need special, special treatment and assistance in certain circumstances when it comes to issues of housing. And again, it's an interesting judgment for the idea of the positive role of the state, what the state owes to disadvantaged racial groups. And finally, let me mention the DH in Czech Republic case. This is an extremely significant decision from a European perspective. It involved segregation of Roma children. Roma children in Eastern Europe, many Eastern European countries, are effectively placed, diverted into special schools where they get special teaching programs which don't seem to work. They tend to leave school very, very early. The vast majority never go anywhere near first level education. Very, very low rates of educational achievement in these schools. Dramatically worse achievement rates than for everyone else to check than the average in Czech schools. The Czech government said, "Well, we've simply applied testing. We've indicated that Roma children." have special needs, we've sent them to our special needs schools. It's not our fault if this happens. Now, the problem
problem is, of course, that you have a cycle of racial disadvantage being driven here. But the testing procedures being used by the Czech educational system was confirming that Roma children weren't terribly skilled at sitting tests. This was then used to put them in special schools that diverted them from the main education system. So we have a cycle of disadvantage being locked in here. And the European Court of Human Rights found that the, the way these tests were being implemented constituted indirect discrimination against Roma. The structure and nature of the tests produced a disparate impact disadvantage and Roma members couldn't be justified. I would make an argument that the court actually made, it didn't go far enough. That the court should actually, in the circumstances, have made a finding of direct discrimination that actually sufficient evidence existed that the Czech government was doing nothing to deal with the problem of segregation. But that's a particular little uh, academic bugbear of mine. Um, so what I've done basically is give you some outlines of the problems and challenges that face courts in applying race discrimination legislation, but also sometimes human rights provisions, constitutional provisions when it comes to race discrimination. Um, there, it presents as an area complex challenges, often made more complicated, to finish on my, final, on my first point, because it's an area that people talk well about, that everyone is against race discrimination. But the complexity of race discrimination, the different forms it takes, poses great challenges for legal systems. And I hope that what I've given you today very briefly and what you've heard this morning has given you at least a feel for how the UK and European courts in general try to deal with some of these issues. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sine. It was uh, really interesting to add valuable information regarding the uh, racial discrimination which initially I thought may not be extremely relevant while dealing with the cases by, uh, by the domestic courts and the domestic laws but it is really in this age of globalization when large section of population move around and work across the globe I think this area on which the information is extremely scanty. You have added valuable input to our, uh, to our information bank. Thank you so much for, uh, for uh, dealing with this relatively less informed area so far as the dealing of domestic laws are concerned. But as I said, this is extremely relevant and important in, uh, in this age of globalization, especially when there are the, uh, the problem of immigration and the immigration laws. And I, uh, I guess this needs to be more informed and touched upon at a global level where the participation not only of two countries but at the international forum, maybe at a much larger scale, is required to be discussed, deliberated, and addressed. Thank you so much for this valuable uh, presentation which you have given. Uh, although you say it's you have given it in an outline way, but I guess you have touched upon the subject in a very extensive way which uh, the outline can give a direction and food for thought for all of us as to how to explore, extend, and uh, broaden the horizon on the laws on racial discrimination. I think this is really a very valuable presentation that you have given to, as I said, to the, to the gathering, which is which might be dealing a lot on the discrimination and equality part, but in terms of racial discrimination, I think it was extremely relevant to inform this gathering. Thank you once again. Now, the last speaker uh, in this uh, session 
is a professor. Uh, uh, please excuse me for my uh, if I pronounce your name incorrectly because this is again the lack of information. So I would now call upon Professor uh, Professor uh, Joshua Castellino to deliver his uh, uh, talk on the subject of discrimination on the grounds of religion. I think which is in the Indian context, it is a very burning topic, especially when in the two-party system, one claims to be secular and other also claims to be secular as a religious overtone. I think it would be extremely interesting to hear your presentation, who, who comes, uh, which would come, uh, the, uh, the information would come from across the boundary. Let us have and welcome your views on the subject. Just one second. There's a little change in the program as you can make out as just this uh, Mishra mentioned. The four speakers who were to speak later will speak first thing tomorrow morning. Justice Ravidran will chair the session. He will not speak and the four speakers will speak tomorrow. So Joshua Castellino is going to be our last speaker and then we go for the tour of the Nehru Memorial. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank you, Colin. Um, honorable judges, advocates, uh, activists, academics, uh, being the last speaker of the day, I guess, means that I have to keep you awake for a start. Uh, and Lord Walker told us this morning that he was striking the first blow, in a sense, because he was worried about the academics to come. Well, I am engaging in what uh, the Israeli Defense Forces controversially call anticipatory self-defense, because I can't, than me, I can't speak about English cases to English judges, who, and their lordships who know more about it than me. Than me. I can't speak about European Court of Human Rights cases because we have Justice Palm here. I can't speak about legislation because I understand you want cases. So I'm going to speak very briefly and I'm going to fit in quite deep waters here. Uh, and I'm going to look at cases that I hope you haven't heard of. Uh, but on a more serious point, I think the, the, the reason to, to fish in these deep waters is partly a point I'm borrowing from uh, what Justice O'Regan said, which is that if you're looking at inequality and discrimination cases, you probably should start by countries who face the similar kind of Gini coefficient that India does. Uh, and while the, the other cases might be interesting in the development of concepts and legal principles, in terms of actual problems and solutions, they don't always offer very good, um, very good solutions and very good practical ways out. Well, as I'm hoping the ones that I have picked will give you something of an insight. Uh, I think essentially there are three crucial questions for me in the context of looking at this question of religion and human rights. And the first one is, are religious rights a sui generis entity? Should they be a completely separate standalone category? And they should not be maybe a human rights category. And the, the provisions made thereby uh, for religious minorities to have their own institutions. And, and again, I think that the Supreme Court has advocated on this or has adjudicated on this issue in the Pai case in 2002. The interesting um, aspect from this other Malaysian case which is Merdeka University and Government of Malaysia from 1981, what concerned the, the attempt by the, by the Chinese population within Malaysia to create a Chinese language uh, university, specifically as a finishing school for the Chinese uh, language students who were in the school system. And in that particular context, this community sought to create their own educational establishment. And it was, it was determined in that case that actually to do so would go against principles of national security. Now, we all understand and probably we'll hear much more uh, from Lord Walker tomorrow about how the security structure has redefined what we think of as human rights values. But this is 1981, so this is long before September 11th. And I think it shows the extent to which states have reserved for themselves, uh, uh, perhaps in the ECHR language, a margin of appreciation to interpret norms of national security. And in that particular context, the Malaysian court upheld the decision not to give the Chinese a chance to build their own university, which proved controversial and continues to prove controversial today. My third, I hope I'm doing okay on my two minutes per category. My third, uh, my third category really needs to do with religious conversion. Again, an issue I think that we have seen perhaps in an Indian context and we are likely to see. Uh, it, it takes into account a whole range of issues, including proselytization and a whole series of other like-minded issues. In Malaysia, by the way, this has been a very, very controversial um, area, a, a particularly controversial case being the Lina Joy case, in which Lina Joy, who converted from Islam to Christianity, was deemed an apostate, 
and uh, thereby subject to the death penalty, which of course wasn't it wasn't uh, executed at the in the final moment. But a really more controversial case concerned Susie Teo, and again you have the case reference in, in my sheet. Uh, Susie Teo was a, a at the time a 16 year old Chinese girl who decided to convert. Went ahead to do that. Her parents sought to prevent her from doing this and went to the went to a constitutional court to argue that as a minor, because she was 16 years of old, 16 years of age, she didn't have the right to make this determination herself and that they, as her parents, could do that for her. Now, interestingly, Malaysia has a, a very much a parallel jurisdiction with Sharia courts operating alongside constitutional courts and the question became whether, whether constitutional courts actually had jurisdiction and it was determined in more detail. Uh, another case that came up, and I think it, it came up in an earlier context, um, and this occurred in, in Israel, uh, it's Rufusin and the Minister of Interior, uh, where Rufusin was essentially denied citizenship of the State of Israel after he converted to Christianity from, from, from Judaism. And the argument really was, well, uh, the, the judges there upheld the fact that Israel was constituted as a state, as a homeland for Jewish people, and therefore the fact that this individual who was previously Jewish, who was now Catholic, could then be denied a citizenship right. Quite a controversial decision, an old one, 1962. Um, again, we had some allusion to this in the Klimenos case in, against Greece, which, uh, which Justice Palm referred to earlier. Again, another I issue here that, uh, which is that there is this issue of recognition of religious groups quite widely prevalent. Uh, we face it across the border in, in Pakistan, where the Ahmadis, for instance, aren't recognized, and uh, the Baha'i face particular problems in Iran. And in this particular case that I picked out, um, sorry, the, the, the Jehovah's Witness uh, face a number of um, problems with regards to being recognized as a context like Singapore, where you had voluntary military, uh, where you had uh, compulsory military service, this would undermine the state. It's also uh, interesting in the context that according to the, um, the Wee Chong Jin Constitutional Committee of 1966, Singapore was specifically constituted to be uh, A, on the basis of uh, secularity, and B, to eschew special rights and affirmative action. So that might be something to, to look at as well. And then a fifth category of cases that has come up uh, in an Indian context is with regards to the nature of what is secularism, what is a secular state. And again, we have this Valsama decision going back to 1996 stressing that secular doesn't mean atheist. Where you had, uh, in the aftermath of, the, of Colombia as a state deciding that they were no longer going to be a Catholic, a Christian country, and were going to be instead a secular country, these issues arose once again about special treatment and the extent to which the church could gain special protection. In that case, it was a land rights question. Uh, that decision, by the way, is also echoed quite almost, almost word for word or sentiment for sentiment in a constitutional court decision in Bulgaria a few years later. And New Zealand, too, have faced some of these issues. And I've got a couple of cases there, Carrigan and Renwood, uh, a 1910 case, and Mayborn against Conference uh, of Methodist Church from 1988. Interestingly, Sri Lanka has had an issue on this as well, because you may know that uh, Sri Lanka, uh, the, the constitution of Sri Lanka provides what they call a foremost place for Buddhism, doesn't quite identify Sri Lanka to be constituted a Buddhist state. And uh, the Supreme Court ruled that such a move would be unconstitutional, so it upheld this foremost place for Buddhism without actually stressing that Sri Lanka is a Buddhist state. Okay, three more categories to go then. Uh, my sixth category is registration of religious affiliation, and this is the, the one that concerns the Ahmadis and the Baha'i. Uh, my, my particular decision that I wanted to focus on on age, uh, again, this is to do with the fact that on your registration ID card in Egypt, your religious affiliation is put down. But if you're Baha'i, you don't have a religion. Now, if you don't have a religion, you can't get an ID card. If you can't get an ID card, you can't vote. So there's all these issues of direct and indirect discrimination that arise. And in that particular uh, decision, it was held that th this category had to be removed altogether. The religious affiliation category had to be removed. Uh, the government acted quite quickly, and I guess in, in light of what's happening now, might possibly happen in the next two or three weeks, you may have got some insights into how the, there's again, questions that arise about uh, discrimination. And then the case that was mentioned by, by Justice Palm, the Sajid and Finchy case, which arose in the European Court of Human Rights, which had arisen as a case in the Constitutional Court of uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, every, all, all really focusing on the time to the Dayton Agreement, this was a necessary measure, but it was justified, that discrimination. But he also left himself open to the fact that the European Court of Human Rights might subsequently reverse the decision. Prophetic words, because that's exactly what happened. When it got to the European Court of Human Rights, they said, I'm sorry, this, is, uh, this isn't uh, justifiable discrimination. Okay, 
Uh, my seventh category of cases then is on indigenous peoples. And I think I, in I introduced this category partly because there is this link that indigenous people in the context of Israel, where the Israeli state has determined that it will only recognize religious marriages and not secular marriages. And this is a very it, that, that particular decision remains controversial in Israel to this day because it means that you have to engage in a religious marriage. The result is that most Israelis who want to have secular marriages go to Lebanon to get married. Uh, if cases, I think, uh, if, if you had to do these cases within the European Court of Human Rights, you'd have to talk about the Refah Parthisi case in Turkey, you'd have to talk about the Halab in Switzerland, you'd have to talk about Leila Sahin, uh, mainly to do with also the place in a public sphere for religion. But by and large, when you, when you fish in deeper water and context post 1995, it's very much conditioned by the Andijan experience, where the government essentially took action against those it said were Muslims but were not praying in an appropriate manner. So by and large, I would say that when you go beyond the realms of the, the, the known cases and the known world, these cases about dress sense don't tend to arise so much. So I want to leave you with five um, things that I would offer as tentative conclusions. Firstly, I think there is a continued relevance only in the European context and perhaps wider field lies in the extent to which states are perceiving uh, Islam to be an enemy. And I think Islamophobia is something that is very much on the agenda. And if you think that uh, this issue is significant in Europe, you should see what, Chinese, what the Chinese do. Discrimination shouldn't be underestimated. My second uh, point really is that I do believe that uh, judicial decisions of the nature that I've pointed out to can, in some societies, act as a bulwark against further uh, religious profiling. And that in many ways, these questions of religion are extremely sensitive, and societies simply aren't ready to take those issues up. But in, in many courts, Thirdly, I think you can't really talk about reinforcing a belief in human rights without paying due attention to religious rights. Because even though there might be a competing basis of legitimacy between religion and human rights, these necessarily interact. And I think we're seeing a range of cases on hate speech, blasphemy, and a whole slew of other issues that we need to find our way through and pick through that are quite complicated. Uh, my fourth question touches on the point that many have touched on before and that Colin touched on most recently, which is I think there is an element of the group rights, and I think you, you, with regards to religious discrimination, um, there is a one the, 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 your, your dose of paper from me if that's what you need. Thank you very much. So, thank you, Professor, for your intelligent and jovial presentation. And I, th I thought you are, you are not only a professor, you can be a diplomat too. <laughs> Because you have left, left your homebound problems and gone across the boundary. But it's a good thing because we need to be informed more as, as to what's happening outside so that we can learn a lesson to treat the problem within the bounds of the domestic corridor. Thank you so much for this presentation. And I think uh, we are all uh, now looking forward uh, for tomorrow's uh, deliberations, and uh, uh, I, I, I really don't know whether this is the Thanksgiving <coughs> ceremony is on the compare of this program, or it is left to Professor uh, to, to uh, Mr. Gonsalve on this. But uh, I think uh, we have all, you know, uh, added. Even if it is like a drop in an ocean added to our information bank, it was really an interesting afternoon for all of us and a great opportunity to listen to the views of the, uh, the judges, the jurists, the academicians in, the, in such a pleasant and amiable surrounding where we all agree at least when we are together, leaving the disagreement to be expressed in so many other ways. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you, everybody. We have the tour starting right away from the downstairs, so we can take a little break and we'll meet downstairs and the tour of the National the, the Memorial Park. Dinner is at 6.45, very early for us to give, but it's at 6.45 uh, in the same place. You can keep your things here, yes.